for the nice introduction. I'll just quickly give you some perspective. I started my first company 12 years ago, back when I lived in Poland. It grew to be one of the largest Ruby on Rails development um, agencies in Europe. I then started Base CRM, which is a successful startup on its own. I went through Y Combinator in the summer of 2012 and then became a partner at a um, great Eastern European VC fund. So I was doing well financially and I was, you know, a, um, seen as successful and I love the world of tech, but I, something was not feeling right. And, and I realized after some introspection that I was quite frustrated about this amazing potential the world of tech has and what it is applied to. Um, and because of that, and I realized that I would like to align my professional life with what I, um, what I believe about the world. So I moved to San Francisco and I started Impact.Tech, which was a community and right now um, a big organization focused on finding all those ways in which technology can solve big problems in the world. And I think this graph is a good representation of many of, or, or, or of, many of the problems uh, we have on, or in, the, in the world. So when you, when you think of the exponential curve of population growth and consumption and the user resources, then you, you sort of realize that what we're working with is we're working with that curve. And, and exponentials are hard, but they're not hard in some abstract way. I guess maybe they're even hard in some easy way. You just need solutions that can map to those exponentials. So, and, 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 and that was the first thought that, you know, how, what are the solutions that could map to those problems that we have that are not solved yet and they're still growing. And, and then I started thinking, how does change ever happen in the world? How, you know, how in the history have we seen examples of certain um, exponential solution, solution curves being delivered? And um, I realized that a common vessel for change happening in the world where you have a group of people who are starting some sort of organization and they're maybe, they're extremely driven and, and there's people who personally care about the cause. They understand what's going on in the world. They, they know um, how to use technology and they want to scale fast because of the curves that I was talking about. And they can attract the, the world's smartest people to join them and they can get the funding um, they need. And then I had this aha moment that, which maybe you know you already <laughs> was not is not an aha moment for you, but you know these organizations that start small and could, but could bring about major change, the, the, these are tech startups, right? So actually, I might be getting in trouble with David, wherever he is, and the Founders Pledge team, but I think in the world where you already have, you're already working in tech, and you already have the skills and the expertise and the experience um, that you have, I think the world needs that even more than it needs your money. So around the time when I was thinking about it, I read this phenomenal essay that Winston Churchill wrote in 1931, 87 years ago. It's called 50 Years Hence. And in that essay, he, um, looking at the scientific progress at the time, he predicts genetic engineering, wireless communication, um, modern synthetic bio biology using microbes as a platform uh, for making things. He predicts lab-grown meat. He talks about how it's, um, it's irrational that we're growing the entire animal just to harvest the wing, the chicken just to harvest the wing, instead of growing just the wing under um, a suitable medium in a lab. It's an amazing essay, and in the second part of it, he talks about the, uh, the incredible powers that scientists and technologies ha technologists have. And he talks about how already back then, how those, the, the pace of change is going to keep accelerating and a small group of people will essentially start faster and faster defining the reality for everyone else. So he ends this essay by talking about the responsibility um, and the need for taking very principled approach for the types of things we're working on. And, and because of that essay and just being inspired by, 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 um, by, that, um, by that amazing vision of Winston, my partner um, and friend from Y Combinator, um, Seth, started 50 years with the mission of 
of helping um, companies that are solving uh, the world's biggest problems with technology and using everything we've learned um, in the years to date to help those companies grow and be successful. We um, are based in San Francisco. We believe that um, actually some of the world's biggest problems can, can and should be looked at business opportunities where some, um, uh, when the market is waiting for the technology or when the market is waiting for the cost to be driven down. We believe that we should not only focus on making money, but we should uh, be solving big problems in the world doing so. So as I said before, to solve those exponentially growing problems, we need solutions that can map them. And the biggest problems uh, can be the, big, the um, uh, biggest opportunity. So some of you uh, might think that it's maybe better to focus on making money first and then generating a lot of, the, uh, of, a lot of it uh, to charity. We disagree. We think there are, it's not always possible, but at least you should try to uh, figure out what, what could be a great way of aligning those two words. And you're going to feel great about it. So, um, and the reason for that is, A, no business is truly neutral. So if you're not solving problems, it might be that you're actually contributing to some existing ones or creating new ones. And B, just from a, just from, um, just from a, just from a potential of how big whatever you're doing can grow, it will, it's going to be harder and harder to, to attract top people to, if you're actually not focusing on big problems in the world. So why deep tech? Uh, it's, 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 it's mostly a pragmatic realization that there is a reason why certain problems persist and we're, it's an invitation to look um, deeper to, uh, and, and some, some of the, uh, the low-hanging fruits of the sort of traditional tech has been already picked. So this, and, and if you're not clear what that means, uh, deep tech, it's a good proxy for saying that anything that comes from academia, maybe you need PhDs on the team and good examples would be synthetic biology, cellular agriculture, food tech, robotics, and, and, and things that maybe are a bit harder, but maybe for that reason we should be focusing our time and energy on them. Um, and conveniently, it's, been never been, it's never been cheaper to, to start uh, uh, deep tech companies. There's been um, advances in computational um, um, discovery, um, shared uh, wet labs, cloud labs, the invention of CRISPR, the falling cost of genome sequencing, you know, depending on the vertical, there's, there's been many compounding technological advancements. And just, you know, just to, just to, just to, um, just to focus on a, a few companies, uh, great examples, Genentech uh, was sold for $46 billion, Illumina is a $42 billion company, and Tesla is getting to 60. And I, you, one could argue that those companies actually have more positive impact on the world than some of the uh, leading nonprofits in, in the areas uh, where they operate. So if you're convinced, Hopefully, um, uh, I don't have too much time to convince you, but there are many problems, and it's sometimes easy to get overwhelmed with them. But if you look at them as, as opportunities, there's this amazing um, cheat sheet of opportunities uh, that you're all familiar with. And this should be the start of your business ideation. And I actually encourage you to download it and look at it. And actually, the whole list is not this. It goes pretty deep. It goes into targets, indicators, and it's many pages of writing. But it actually helps you um, organize your thoughts around you know, what actually are th those big problems mean and what smaller problems con uh, you know, are part constitute of the big uh, problems. And then things that naturally get you excited are probably good indicators of maybe where you should be looking for solutions. Um, and then finding solutions is um, probably a separate talk on its own, but I just encourage you to not uh, go with the most obvious ones right away. So when you think of the goal um, number 13, climate action, if you really care about, uh, if you really believe and care about climate change, <laughs> hopefully you do, um, sorry, <laughs> bad joke. Um, um, you should, you can think of clean energy or the electric vehicle revolution, but some of you will know here that animal agriculture actually contributes more to the greenhouse gases and gas emissions than land, air, and uh, um, water transportation sectors combined. So then, and, and the reasons are, is this. This is the state of the art technology we've been using for protein production for the last 10,000 years. And it's a very cute and lovely uh, uh, technology, but it's very inefficient. Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with this stat. The energy conversion is absolutely irrational. No, no business could be funded around uh, putting one, uh, putting 30 of something in and getting one of it out. It's a definition of waste. 
And then, um, and then, you know, there's all the land and water use and all the other problems with animal agriculture that you, you, I don't have time to talk about. And then food is an $8 trillion industry, and one trillion of that is the conventional animal agriculture. So you can think, you can, um, just to get you inspired, uh, one company that we were honored to back early on is Memphis Meats, and they are growing real, and um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with them, growing real meat in, in, in the outside of animals, um, and innovating and cre bringing something new to the market for the trillion dollar conventional meat industry, while at the same time, contributing not just to the climate, um, not, just, not just to the climate um, uh, action goal, but also to goals around hunger, health, responsible consumption, uh, life on land, and, um, and, and a few more. And that could be a massively profitable business that's on its own could maybe pretty much also contribute to the starting an industry. So in that, in that whole theme of cellular agriculture, uh, another company that gets you inspired is Geltor. They, they grow... And they use synthetic biology to grow collagen and gelatin. So using a different platform, but essentially also innovating around animal ingredients. Or vitro labs that grow real uh, leather in the lab so we don't have to take, uh, use animals for leather anymore. Or a company from a uh, totally different area that is growing small satellites to provide internet for half of the world's population that have no access. That's, that's zero access to internet. And, uh, you know, I don't have to explain why that's a great business opportunity, but uh, they actually, by no nonprofit can currently at least deliver that service. And it's so important for poverty, for access to opportunities, for living in the same reality that we live. Those uh, people don't have uh, the same choices we do. So I want to leave you with this thought before they kick me off the stage. Yes, time is up. Um, that altruism, altruism is, is action are actions taken uh, for the well-being of others. And no matter how you define others, you can define them as just humans, maybe other sentient beings, maybe you, you care sort of about the, the life on Earth in general. Um, I, it's important that the actions are efficient. And because you are technologists and because you understand how to start something and grow something, I just want to bring to your attention that um, starting those companies and, and kind of using the powers of capitalism and also helping us get out of this stupid Friedman doctrine where, um, um, where and this extractive version of, of capitalism is, um, is a, at least a good thing to consider if you're thinking of how your skills and your resources can help uh, fix um, some problems in the world. Thank you. Thank you for that. So, you may have not had enough time to convince all of us, but there is more time for Q&A. So uh, particularly the ones who are not convinced, I would encourage you to get on Slido uh, and start submitting questions. Um, OK, so first up, how do you measure uh, the social impact of your investments? Do you correlate monetary returns to social returns in social businesses? We're early stage, so we don't, um, we don't do assessment around their, I mean, often when we invest, it's, there's, a, there's a group of people trying to get something off the ground with the prototype build. So it's um, the, the, the main optic for us is whether the business model and what they're trying to do is, is, is well aligned with solving a big problem in the world. Because if the business model is actually not aligned, then um, it's, it's pro there's probably going to reasons why, why it's not going to work out. So we, we want to see a very direct correlation between achieving the vision of the problem and significantly contrib contributing to achieving one of the SDGs. And this is the best we can do as an early stage investor. Great. And then in terms of uh, your equation with the heart as the answer, where does uh, philanthropy fit into that? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, it doesn't fill into that equation, but it, I mean, it plays an important role in the world, and we're not trying to say that philanthropy um, um, is, is, um, is irrelevant. We, we, we're just, we're, uh, what we're saying is certain problems can be um, solved more efficiently with business, and if it happens so that many of the world's smartest people want to work in tech startups and they want to align what they're doing also with their future financial stability. And, and there's so much great know-how around scaling and running those organizations that I think it's just a very good tool in the toolbox. This, this has, it doesn't say that, um, it doesn't comment on how relevant philanthropy is. I think it's important. Great. Uh, 
what's the number one area of tech we should be we should all be looking into right now? Well, I'm. I think. I, I think just by the examples I was giving, we're quite excited about cellular agriculture and and just there's this it. it it's a very new um, area, and it needs a, a lot of support. Um, and it can bring an incredible transformation really fast. I think we, we see that for anyone who, you know, environmental impact of animal agriculture is so clear. And then anyone who has a problem with, with, with us using sentient beings as, as technology for protein production, I, I, I think um, uh, it's a great it's a great area to look, and then at the same time, people like meat. It's there is a lot there is interesting developments happening in plant based technologies, and we've backed uh, companies in that space as well, and technologies in that space, food processing for plant based foods, and so on. But the the last year has been the peak year for meat globally, and this year will be even higher. So while all those gr things are great, we're we keep um, the meat, global meat consumption is still rising. So. Um, it's important to be realistic about what, what is happening in the world and what needs what is a pragmatic uh, approach to that. So I'm excited about that and also synthetic biology because there's many uses of synthetic biology and algae fermentation and, and for, for other um, ways of kind of producing the perfect protein stack for uh, the developed uh, uh, countries that are obsessed with their protein. Right? Mm. So. With the risk that any new tech introduces to the world, uh, how do you ensure that ben that the benefits outweigh the adverse effects? Well, that's hard, right? Because you can you could argue that we're less happy because of internet, but like maybe we would have been more happy in rural communities and just when and and with less technology, right? So I think a lot of I think the whole discussion on what is welfare, what is happiness, and what is an op optimal uh, society is is tricky. But I think. In general, I think choice is good, and there's been many smart people thinking about the sustainable development goals of like, there's little, it's not a full list, the existential risks are not there, and it's a little bit politicized, but it, I think just following the collective wisdom of people who have been working on it for, and spent many, many hours working on it is a, is a good way of looking for problems and then for solutions. Um, you know, if we have, just have to have responsible people trying to make best decisions, but sometimes inaction is actually way worse than um, than action that you know might in the future have negative externalities. I think that's very clear the case with, I mean philosophically I believe that. I mean, maybe not everybody will agree. I think it's very much the case with animal agriculture. Like you, we have the choice of whether we want to you know use certain technologies or not to some d d extent. And I think in situations when um, there's some injustice and there's no choice, I think that that maybe is a bit more clear. Awesome. Hey. Everyone, let's thank Ella. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you.